Even a brief look into Christian history reveals some complicated paradoxes. How can some adherents of one faith be responsible for so much goodness and beauty in the world, while others are aligned with violence and destruction? This reality stood out to me in a striking way when I watched two very similar animated films that act as bookends of director Tom Moore's Irish folklore trilogy, Wolfwalkers and The Secret of Kells. Both are set in early centuries of Christianity's flourishing in Ireland. Both also feature Christian characters interacting with characters who are, in various ways, representatives of pre-Christian Celtic spirituality. However, the Christianities of these two films could not be more different. In this video, I want to offer some possible reasons behind these differences, and in doing so, highlight some of what makes the legacy of Christianity in the Celtic world unique. In addition, I hope to draw out some lessons, especially for anyone in the Christian tradition who wants to see goodness and beauty flourish in the face of ever-present darkness. I think a helpful first point of contrast between Wolfwalkers and The Secret of Kells is the extent to which a sense of hospitality is practiced by their Christian characters. The abbot in The Secret of Kells is fearful of outsiders and what lies beyond the abbey walls, which is highlighted by his cold, colorless room covered by calculations. Brother Aiden, the newly arrived master illuminator on the other hand, reflects a much friendlier posture. His association with warmth and light, as well as his openness to scientific inquiry and the beauty of nature speak to this. But to me, the key to the film's celebration of hospitality is Brendan, Aiden's mentee and the story's protagonist, seen especially in his friendship with Ashling, the forest fairy. Ashling is, of course, a creature of pre-Christian folklore, and she embodies a pagan sense of a oneness with the natural world. She's no doubt an outsider to those in the Abbey of Kells. And so the mutual affection and assistance that Brendan and Ashling offer each other exhibit a kind of give and take between the Christian and pagan worlds. Brendan is humble and open enough to learn from Ashling, and Ashling is awed by the power that can turn darkness into light. Wolfwalkers, though set in Ireland centuries later, explores a similar dynamic of friendship between the protagonist, Honor, and Maeve, the young Wolfwalker, another figure of traditional Irish folklore. However, the main representative of Christianity in Wolfwalkers is the pious and harsh Lord Protector, who is hell-bent on ridding the town of all wolves and all traces of what he calls pagan nonsense. He is quite inhospitable, even towards the townspeople, and speaks often using imperialist language. He invokes his religion, which is no doubt wrapped up in his political agenda, when inflicting violence. This wild land must be civilized. That is your will. Now both of these films are true to history. The filmmakers themselves link the Christianity of the Lord Protector and Wolfwalkers to that of Oliver Cromwell and the violence of the Cromwellian invasion of the 17th century. The name of Jesus has frequently been invoked alongside the Conqueror's sword. However, it seems to me that the sense of hospitality seen in The Secret of Kells is more true to the overall legacy of Christianity in Ireland, and of course to the heart of Christ. The functioning of the Abbey in the film reflects the vision of many early Christian settlers in Britain practicing what they call a pilgrimage for the love of Christ. Such monastic settlements were as concerned with outreach and community life as they were with the spiritual life within the Abbey walls. Aidan and Brendan both get their names from historical missionaries whose lives reflected this exact spirit. Scholar Kenneth McIntosh writes that, by their practical example of kindness and hospitality, the early Irish and Scottish abbeys set a pattern for the entire society, modeling a standard of neighborly assistance that balanced the cruelties of the Dark Ages. This hospitable posture is also a key characteristic of saints most revered in the Celtic tradition. Take St. Bridget, for example, the 5th century founder and abbish of a hugely influential monastic community. Much like Brendan in the film, she is revered for her sense of compassion, her craftsmanship, and for her openness to elements of native Irish spirituality, such as a deep affection for the natural world. While some view this as problematic, the association of St. Bridget with elements of a pre-Christian goddess of the same name 
can be seen as a legacy of these Christians, who looked at outsiders primarily not with a sense of fear, but rather with the mindset that Christianity is able to take in and transform truth and beauty that is already present in God's good world. Those who hope to carry on the legacy of Celtic Christianity now still recognize that living with availability, vulnerability, and hospitality uniquely shines light in the darkness. Another point worth considering is the theology or ideals that underpin the distinction seen in these two films. Even though Celtic Christianity is not as united or codified as other traditions, I think a broad characteristic of the theology of this region that is relevant to these films is that of incarnational or sacramental principle. This is a notion that is opposed to a dualistic dividing of the spiritual and material. The Celtic Christian world had a very strong awareness of the goodness, indeed the sacredness, of the material world. Sacramental principle makes for an integrated life in which body and soul, work and worship, wonder and ordinariness, prayer and life are the norm. This framework was well suited in a place like Ireland, whose inhabitants already saw the physical world as sacred. The tradition of thin places where the earthly and heavenly realms meet already existed there. The earliest Christians in the British Isles, such as Pelagius in the 4th century, reflected this kind of theology. He wrote that everywhere narrow shafts of divine light pierce the veil that separates heaven from earth. The presence of God's spirit in all living things is what makes them beautiful. It's safe to say that the actions of the Lord Protector and Wolfwalkers are not indicative of this kind of sacramental principle. He refers to the land not as good, but as something wild that needs to be tamed. His attitude towards the wolves, of course, is hostile, at one point calling them demons, which would be opposed by someone like Pelagius who said that there is no creature on earth in whom God is absent. The Lord Protector's speech is also marked by very lofty, heavenly ambitions, no doubt intermingled again with his political ambitions which is very different from the sacredness of the ordinary theology of many Celtic Christians. However, sacramental principle underpins the actions of the Christians in the secret of Kells in countless ways. We see it, for example, in the role that nature plays in the lives of Aidan and Brendan, acting as a consistent source of inspiration and window to the divine. You will learn more in the woods from trees and rocks than in any other place. You will see miracles. It's also relevant to the obvious connection between nature and artistic beauty in the film. I appreciate that the filmmakers show the way that the Illuminator's love of nature inspires the imagery of the Book of Kells. I also love that Brendan's first quest in his journey towards becoming an Illuminator is to get out in creation and gather seeds, a perfect image of nature's potentiality to be used in the making of ink. From tiny berries do great images come to life. Nature, beauty, creativity, and ultimately worship are indeed integrated. It's beautiful to also consider the abbey itself, whose towering central spire is such a key motif in the film. Community life is in every way centered around the abbey, which in turn guides the community and helps turn their eyes towards heaven. It makes sense then for people guided by sacramental principle, who worship a creator who loves his creation, that a central activity in such a place is the creation of beautiful things, things that are meant to reflect back to the community the beauty and love of their creator. The book was never meant to be hidden away behind walls, locked away from the world which inspired its creation. Such is the mindset that no doubt inspired the creators of the real Book of Kells, considered by many to be Ireland's most treasured cultural artifact. And such is the mindset that continues to guide artists and artisans of all kinds even today. In the words of Irish theologian Alexander John Scott, to be made of God is to be made of sacred imagination. It's true that the legacy of Celtic Christianity is marked by love of nature and beauty, creativity and loving hospitality. 
However, the last point I want to make in looking at these two films is that we should not discount the key role that courage and strength play in this legacy as well. To give the devil his due, the Lord Protector in Wolfwalkers is strong and courageous. It's no small feat to pursue and face a pack of dangerous animals. Yet like I've said, it's his lack of love and hospitality, his disregard for nature and beauty, and his greedy imperialist motives that poison his view of the world and his invocation of the Christian faith. I admit that I wonder if similar tendencies are at the heart of many who have lifted the sword in the name of Christ. But turning back again to Brendan and the Secret of Kells, strength and courage are just as central to his coming of age as is his growth as an artist. He begins as an aimless and fearful boy, literally undertaking a wild goose chase at the start of the film. And like all archetypal heroes, he is called to adventure. He is mentored and befriended along the way as he deals with trials. And at the turning point in the film, again like all great heroes, Brendan looks darkness in the eye and battles evil with strength when he courageously faces the demonic figure of Crom Cruach. Parallels to St. Patrick, Ireland's famous patron saint, are obvious here. Yes, the image of Crom Cruach as a snake called to mind the legend of Patrick driving away snakes from Ireland, but I think a better connection is to the actual history of the pagan worship of this deity. Ancient texts claim that some people in Ireland worship Crom Cruach by offering up their firstborn child in return for a plentiful harvest. The children were killed by smashing their heads on a stone idol that represented this deity, and it is written that at one point Patrick confronted the worshippers, smashed this stone, and disbanded this long-standing practice. Just as Brendan vanquished this demon and robbed Crom Cruach of its power. In cases like this, the spiritual battle between darkness and light could not be manifest in a more tangible, earthly way. So while St. Patrick and the early Christian saints are figures of kindness and hospitality, they are also figures of inspiring courage and strength. Now I enjoyed Wolfwalkers for so many reasons. The story is beautiful, the visuals are amazing. But it's just more incredible to me that in The Secret of Kells, these filmmakers were able to portray so many aspects of Celtic Christianity in such a condensed but powerful way. For a modern audience, these films do complicate how one might view Christian history, and specifically the interaction between Christianity and paganism in a place like Ireland. But I would argue that it's a necessary complication. Sometimes goodness and love take the form of hospitality, an embrace of culture, and an integration of various traditions. Sometimes goodness and love take the form of careful craftsmanship and the nurturing of beauty and creativity. But sometimes goodness and love take the form of facing darkness with courage and standing up to fight against evil. That is what turning darkness into light can, and perhaps should, come to mean in its fullest sense. Mm -hmm.